No, no other apologies. Nothing from Jim Wells? Nope. Okay, thank you. Uh, has notice been received from any member to delegate authority to another member of the committee to vote under temporary standing orders? By my name, please, Mark Hughes. Okay. Yep. I think that is. Yep. Uh, declaration of interest and members of any relevant financial or other interest to, to, to declare to the committee? Uh, Chair, if I may, um, I should declare uh, it's not a financial interest, it's a parliamentary yeah. assembly business interest. I am uh, chair of the all-party group on press freedom and media sustainability, which touches on some of the issues we'll be discussing today. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item number three, chairperson's business, uh, national insurance in increase. As members are aware, the House of Commons is today voting on changes to social care in England, which are to be supported by an increase in employees' national insurance contributions. Uh, the press have indicated that the corresponding unhypothecated increase in Northern Ireland's budget might be around about £400 million. Is the committee content to write to the Minister seeking clarity on the impact of Northern Ireland's budget of the national insurance increase, confirmation that budget increases will be unhypothecated, and information on other recently reported health-related budget consequentials? Are we agreed? Agreed. Chair, just one issue I would yeah, go ahead. be interested in. Probably it's not our minister who can answer that, but part of the package announced yesterday was a cap of, I think, 85 or 86,000 pounds yeah. of care <clears throat> payments. Um, is that now in the discretion of the executive as to whether they extend that cap to Northern Ireland? That's all. It's devolved, as the members are aware. So health and social care will be devolved in Northern Ireland. So it will be for our executive, our assembly, to decide whether we copy or not. Yeah. Okay. okay. Matthew. Chair, my, my, uh, I was going to make a suggestion uh, either to include it in our letter to the department slash minister or to write a separate letter to the Treasury to ask for clarification on a point that was included in... Uh, the Prime Minister's statement yesterday, in which he uh, seemed to imply that the Barnet consequential uh, would effectively be hypothecated. That the health and he, he talked about, I don't have the verbatim quote in front of me, but he talked about there would be direct spending by the UK government on health and social care in uh, Northern Ireland, um, which obviously would be a quite a big change to our. Mm -hmm. public spending framework, um, uh, albeit there have been, the UK government has taken some legal powers through the Internal Markets Act to spend directly on what were previously devolved matters. Um, then subsequently there was other, uh, um, what seemed like clarification from the mm -hmm. Treasury to the media, that this money would be dispersed via conventional Barnet methods, but the communication was basically very uh, unclear yesterday, so uh, I think it would be worth our committee seeking clarification on uh, either from the Department of Finance in the first instance or directly via the Treasury about um, uh, how it came up, you know, what the a, what the position is, and b, how the apparent uncertainty came about. I think, uh, I think we should write to the Minister because I think clarification had come from the Treasury that basically said that it was unhypothecated and there was no change in how sort of Barnett was uh, applied to the devolved administrations. But I think it would be worthwhile just to make sure that the Minister uh, sort of clarifies that, yeah. sort of clarifies that clarification. But you know, bearing in mind, um, without prejudice, what the Prime Minister normally speaks and how he speaks, I think I, the Treasury's clarification to me, because when I read that and I thought, oh, that's a change, but then I read what came from the Treasury and it seemed to me to read as if it was, there was no change in how it was being. It could very well have been a bit of, as it were, topspin put in his oral statement at the last minute, but it would be worth us getting clarity from the Finance Minister about his, his department's view, not his view, yeah. just his view, his department's view of um, what happened. Yeah. Uh, sure, I think that's fair enough, but um, generally about matters which are unhypothecated, like we've had a lot of Barnet money. Mm -hmm. At some point I would like to see for some recent financial year or period how much of that we actually spent on a hypothecated basis and how much we squandered or spent elsewhere. As in broken down by yeah, if, how if they have that, that granularity. What it was allocated for and how it was actually spent. Mm. Our questions yeah, we've got those. Chair, does the committee also just want to seek clarity also on the, the question the member asked about the cap? 
Mm. But I mm -hmm. blandly stated that it was yeah. uh, it's a devolved matter, but uh, might be interesting. Well, to that's the question. Yeah. yeah, get the question on here. Okay, we're happy. Uh, moving on to the next item, a spending review. Members are aware the press have indicated that the outcome of the spending review, including a reported 5% cut for Westminster departments and an anticipated multi-year budget, may be known by the end of October. The committee has already written to the minister seeking confirmation on the key timelines and has arranged a briefing from Assembly Research later in the autumn. Would the committee be content to write to the Fiscal Council and ask it to produce a timely report on the spending review outcome and to share the findings at a public committee meeting when the report is available, which may, may then form the subject of a committee motion and potentially a plenary debate? And I think that sort of uh, gives a good indication to, also to the Fiscal Council and the role that we expect of it going forward. Yeah, if I may, sure, thank you. I, I think that um, I think that's wise. I also think. Uh, the 27th of October is from it's earlier than I would have expected. You know, in, mm -hmm. in previous autumn generally means 30th of November slash first week in December, with a bit of sort of w wiggle room around terminology. So it's 27th of October. That's actually quite early. It's also, I believe, we are in recess that week. Um, so it, it does have an impact on our. I mean, we will talk to the forward work programme later on this afternoon. But do we want to consider having a? Um, uh, an evidence session, possibly just from Reyes, possibly from—I um, uh, mean, it could be from a, a you know a, a think a, a, a think tank about uh, the um, uh, about what, what what we should be expecting and what we should be looking out for, as it were. Mm. Well, ahead of twenty seventh, i.e., the week before. Well, let's have a look at sort of the program as a how it, how it evolves. Um, and I think as the closer we get, because I think one thing we're not come on, Jim. One thing we're not um, fully sure yet of sort of the level of the workload we're going to have is coming up to that, and sort yeah. of the timings of that. But we'll keep it under we'll keep it under advisement, Matthew, if you're content with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Chair, can you just restate again what you're writing to the fiscal council for? Yep. Sorry, we're writing to the fiscal council to ask them to produce a timely report on the spending review when they've got it. And to share the findings at a public committee meeting when that report is available, and then that could form the subject of a committee motion and a plenary debate. Happy Malaysia. Thank you, Chair. Okay, cheers. Thanks. Uh, moving on to the next item, uh, climate change number two bill. As members will recall, the committee stage of the Dara sponsored climate number two bill is underway. The bill sets out a carbon budgeting system and indicates there will be associated significant capital investment costs for Northern Ireland departments and Northern Ireland industry and agricultural as well as staffing pressures will arise for the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Is the committee content to write to the department to ask it to set out what, expects it, what it expects the associated costs and staffing pressures might be and whether this will be included in the spending review outcome in the multi-year budget if that, and if they are quoting within the DERA bill associated significant capital investment, I would, I would uh, I would hope they would already discussed the items with the Department of Finance and other committees as well to look at any delta that would be required for additional staffing in other areas. Are we content to do that? Agreed. Yeah. Uh, next item, Chair's Business, Ring Fence, Dell Underspend. Uh, if we go back, I think uh, for members of the committee will remember, we, I think we were quite surprised to discover that there was an issue of the Dell Underspend, of, I think it was about $403 million, and we had not been kept informed of that, but then we have been told it was due to student uh, how student fees were being looked at. As members will recall of the 2021 outturn and the June monitoring round statement, the Minister indicated there was ring fence Dell underspend of four hundred and one point nine million linked to the student loan impairment at the Department of Economy. Officials told the Finance Committee in an evidence session before summer recess that the relevant Barnet consequential of four hundred and forty three point eight million, which was notified to the Department of Finance on the twentieth of January, post-January monitoring was significantly higher than the 133 million pressure identified by the Department for the Economy. So it would appear that the size of the problem of a ring fence Dell underspend was known either to the Department for the Economy or to both the Department for the Economy and the Department for Finance by early February 2021. On its meeting on the 20th of April, we considered monthly, for monthly forecasts and outturn financial information provided by the Department of Finance. This showed the relevant underspend at the Department for Economy for March 21 to be 131 million and not 400 million plus, as was subsequently indicated. Uh, 
We raised this issue on two occasions, and I don't think we really got much in the way of a satisfactory answer. So I'm just asking the committee whether we're content to write to the department in order to seek an explanation as to why the department's information to the finance committee in respect of the substantial underspend was considerably inaccurate when information to the contrary was clearly available, i.e., in January. Are we content to do that? Okay. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, new other item on the agenda: new tech. Oh, sorry, uh, chair's business. Uh, new technology strategy. In a written answer, AQW 2106027-22, the department has indicated that it will be developing a strategy to determine how best new technology, such as artificial intelligence and robotic process automation, can support the Northern Ireland civil service and the delivery to the public services. Are we content to write to the department seeking further details on the scope and timeline for the production of this new policy? I think that would be quite interesting to discover what they're doing on robotics and AI. Thank Might you. get a robotic answer. Uh, probably. <laughs> um, during the weekend, I attended the British Irish Association, and at the British Irish Association meeting, I know it was covered in Chatham House rules, but Paul Johnson, who is to be, who is. Uh, a chair of the uh, Independent Fiscal Commission that's looking at tax raising powers. He gave a very good presentation to uh, the association about issues to do with tax raising, to do with VAT, and some key issues that he'd already discovered that would be worthwhile. I think it would be very useful if this committee could see that presentation, because I think it was particularly helpful in understanding, and it cleared a lot of issues up for me as well. I would like, with the committee's permission, to write to Paul Johnson and ask him if he would make that uh, presentation available. And I understand uh, he has indicated that he would do so, but I would like to get your permission to do that if we are agreed. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, next item: draft minutes of proceedings of the 1st of September. The draft minutes of the Finance Committee meeting of the 1st of September at the page seven. Are we content with the draft minutes? Great. Great. No matters arising. Uh, so, can I remove all the members from the spotlight and bring the research officer to the spotlight from Ray's place? I think it's Raymond, is it? <coughs> it is. Chair, yeah. Hi, Raymond. Hello, Chair. Hello, okay. members. Yep. Uh, we are now receiving an oral briefing uh, from Ray's on the defamation bill. Uh, the following papers are relevant to the agenda item research paper at page 19. Raymond, over to you. Okay, thanks, Chair. Uh, so I'll begin by really setting the context in relation to Northern Ireland uh, in terms of where we are with defamation law uh, and the moves in recent years to bring about change. Um, this will focus substantially on the work of the, the Northern Ireland Law Commission and subsequently uh, that of Dac Dr. Andrew Scott, uh, my professor, I believe. Uh, I'll then move on to a discussion of the Defamation Act uh, 2013 as it applies in England and Wales. Uh, which, of course, the Private Members' Bill replicates, and I'll highlight areas uh, of interest. Uh, the paper included information on developments in Scotland uh, and the Republic of Ireland. I don't intend to address these during this presentation, um, as really the key point of reference is the Defamation Act uh, 2013 and the associated commentary around that. Um, before we get into it, I suppose, in terms of defining defamation, the, the paper contains a, a few different definitions, but broadly, a statement about a person is defamatory if it causes harm to the person's reputation, that is, if it tends to lower the person's reputation uh, in the estimation of ordinary persons. So, Northern Ireland, the civil law on defamation in Northern Ireland uh, has really developed through common law with some aspects codified in, in statute. Uh, it's essentially the same as the law in England and Wales prior to the implementation of, of the Defamation Act in 2013. Um, the Defamation Act uh, of 1952 did not extend to Northern Ireland, uh, although the subsequent Defamation Act of 1955 generally introduced the provisions of the 52 Act uh, into Northern Ireland law. Um, there was also the 1996 Defamation Act, and again, this mostly applied uh, to Northern Ireland. To we'll bring it more up to date, uh, so attempts to reform defamation law in Northern Ireland have really gathered pace uh, in recent years. Uh, and of course, Mr. Nesbitt had reached the consultation stage with the previous bill, um, but it paused his work to allow the uh, Law Commission to examine the issue in detail. So a 2014 report from the Law Commission uh, was followed by a report uh, by Dr. Andrew Scott of the London School of Economics uh, on behalf of the Department of Finance. Uh, and Mr. Nesbitt's original private member's bill was included as an appendix in the, the Scott report. 
the Law Commission had concluded that there was good reason to believe that defamation law, uh, as it was currently structured, uh, does not best serve either the interests of the immediate parties to publication disputes or the interests of the wider public uh, in the circulation of accurate information matters of importance. So the Scott Report, uh, which built on the work of the Law Commission, uh, summed it up that, to a significant extent, measures equivalent to the provisions of the Defamation Act 2013 should be introduced into Northern Ireland law. Specifically, this includes strong recommendations that the following provisions should be emulated, uh, and again with consequential changes reflecting um, uh, the change in jurisdiction. And that would be the defence of truth, defence of publication on a matter of public interest, qualified privilege for peer-reviewed scientific or academic statements, extension of existing qualified privileges, a single publication rule, uh, power of court to order publication of summary of judgment, power of court to order takedown of statements, uh, and updating the law of slander. It then went on to say that uh, the following provisions of the Defamation Act should be emulated, uh, although in each of these cases it uh, considered that the argument for the introduction of, of the provision was less compelling, uh, and this was the serious harm test, uh, and then uh, action against a person not domiciled in the UK or a member state. Uh, on this issue, um, this is really libel tourism. Uh, the Northern Ireland Law Commission, uh, its original consultation paper, noted that it is difficult to identify many firm cases of libel tourism that have occurred in the Northern Irish courts, um, although it did surmise that such cases may have, may have occurred. Um, the Scott report stated that the unanimous view of all respondents to the Law Commission consultation, uh, who explicitly addressed that point, uh, was that such reform was desirable. Uh, so, for example, the, the reform was variously described as important uh, and small but significant. Uh, and members will, will note that a report published under the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Act of 2019 uh, found that in the period from 2010 to 2018, there were on average uh, 35 Queen's bench writs for defamation per annum, uh, ranging from 19 in 2017 to 54 uh, in 2010. Um, it went on to say that that report went on to say that Northern Ireland's current law um, provides that a claim can be summar summarily dismissed where no real or substantial tort has occurred, uh, and it concluded that therefore libel tourism would not be straightforward. Uh, the third area that the Scott report said uh, should be introduced, but where it felt there was less compelling evidence, was the presumption in favour of trial by judge alone. Um, so the, the Northern Ireland Law Commission consultation paper noted the uh, anomalous position that defamation trials um, alone in civil law proceedings uh, currently involve a presumption in favour of trial by a judge with a jury. Uh, now, a strong view among those respondents who replied specifically to that question was that the jury should be removed from defamation proceedings. Uh, it was generally thought that the continued role for the jury was a barrier to uh, the efficient management of defamation cases. Uh, and that it negated opportunities for the early resolution of key facets of defamation proceedings. Uh, and I said against this, the Scott report stated that the historical and constitutional importance of the jury in the Northern Ireland context should, should not uh, lightly be undermined. And really to, to sort of bring that together, the Scott report noted that um, a viewpoint expressed frequently to the Northern Ireland Law Commission by those in favour of the introduction of reforms, uh, equivalent to those set out in the 2013 Act, was that Northern Irish law should emulate the English legislation without any substantive change. Um, but then the report identified a, a desire on the part of those who advocated this position uh, to also go beyond that legislation to really address areas specific uh, to Northern Ireland. And again, uh, the report highlighted two areas where it felt Northern Ireland uh, should not, in fact, replication, replicate the Defamation Act 2013. Um, this was the jurisdictional exclusion relating to secondary publishers. Uh, this is found in Section 10 of the, the 2013 Act. Uh, and the Scott report stated that this should not be introduced uh, in its current form. Um, rather, that exclusion should be extended uh, to prevent any defamation claim being brought against the person other than the primary author, editor or publisher of a statement. And this would lead on uh, to 
the fact that no equivalent to the defense for website website operators found in Section 5 of the Defamation Act 2013 uh, need be introduced into Northern Ireland law, uh, and that existing defenses for intermediaries can uh, be repealed. Um, moving on now to the Defamation Act 2013 and turning to look at uh, some of its key provisions, uh, and again bearing in mind that the Private Members Bill replicates this, so it's sort of the commentary in these clauses serves for, for the Private Members Bill uh, as well. Uh, really the, the 2013 Act in England and Wales had been the culmination of pressure exerted over many years to reform law uh, in this area. Uh, and again, one of the main concerns was the, the so-called practice of libel tourism, um, really meaning that people could bring cases in England and Wales, even though the, the case had little connection to that jurisdiction, basically believing they had a better chance of winning compared to other jurisdictions. Uh, the government also recon uh, recognised worries that the threat of libel proceedings might be used to frustrate a robust scientific uh, and academic debate or to imp impede responsible investigative journalism, and this is the so-called uh, chilling effect. Um, so essentially the 2013 Act was designed to ensure that a, a fair balance was struck uh, between the right to freedom of expression uh, and the protection of reputation. So looking at some of the key provisions of the Act, um, Section 1 established a threshold of serious harm, whereby a statement cannot be defamatory unless the claimant can show that its publication has caused or is likely to cause serious harm to his or her reputation. Uh, and essentially the intention of this was to de deter trivial claims. Um, it has had its critics. Uh, it has been described as the Act's most opaque, albeit well-intentioned, uh, innovation whose practical effect polarised legal opinion from the outset. And just to spend a bit, uh, some more time on this, it was tested when a, a French resident, uh, Bruno Lachaud, sued two British newspapers over allegations uh, that they had printed about him. Um, now, the High Court rejected the newspaper's arguments that the statements were not defamatory because they did not meet the serious harm threshold in the Defamation Act. Uh, in 2017, the Court of Appeal dismissed the newspaper's appeal. Uh, and it has been argued that the incremental result of this was a 70% increase in defamation claims from 2017 to 2018. Uh, the Supreme Court found that the reference in Section 1 to a situation where the statement has caused serious harm is to the consequences of the publication, not the publication itself. Uh, Lord Sumption uh, said that this points to some historic harm, which is shown to have actually occurred and as a proposition of fact which can be established only by reference to the impact which the statement is shown uh, actually to have had. Um, so this depends not only on a combination of the uh, inherent tendency of the words, but also their actual impact on those to whom they were communicated. So in the Supreme Court's view, uh, the defamatory character of the statement no longer depends only on the meaning of the words uh, and their inherent tendency to damage the claimant's reputation. Uh, and it is to that extent the Parliament intended to change uh, the common law. Uh, Section 2 provides for the defence of truth. It renamed the common law defences of justification and fair comment as ones of truth and honest opinion, and really were intended to make the law simpler uh, and clearly understand and apply. Um, subsection 1 provides for the new defence to apply, where the defendant can show that the imputation conveyed by the statement complained of is substantially true. Um, and that reflected the current law as established in the case of Chase versus News Group Newspapers Limited, uh, where the Court of Appeal indicated that in, in, or found that in order for the defence of justification to be available, the defendant does not have to prove that every word he or she, she published was true. He or she has to establish the essential or substantial truth of the stem of the libel. So it essentially codified the prior position. Uh, and again, was, was really intended to make the law simpler and clearer for people. Uh, Section 3 of the Act replaced common law defence of fair comment with a new defence of honest opinion. Uh, defendant has to meet three conditions to be able to rely, rely on this defence. Uh, firstly, that the statement complained of was a statement of opinion. Secondly, that the statement complained of indicated, whether in general or specific terms, the basis of the opinion. And finally, that an honest person Sorry, that an honest person could have held the opinion on the basis of any fact which existed at the time the statement was published, or anything asserted to be a fact in the statement published before the statement complained of. Um, but the defence would be defeated if the claimant can show that the defendant did not hold the opinion. 
Section four uh, created a new public interest defense. Um, this section provided a new statutory defense to those publishing responsibly on matters of public interest. And this built on the previous common law defense. Uh, and previous analysis of this clause found that in order to be able to rely on the defense, the defendant must show that the statement was or formed part of a statement on a matter of public interest and that he reasonably believed that publishing the statement complained of was in the public interest. So the defense therefore contains both a, a subjective element, what the defendant believed was in the public interest at the, at the time of publication, and an objective element, whether the belief was a reasonable one. Section five, uh, this created a new defense for the operators of websites where a defamation action is brought against them in respect of a statement posted on their website. So it provides a defense to website operators uh, who choose to follow a process aimed at enabling a complainant to protect their reputation uh, by resolving matters uh, directly with the person who is responsible for the defamatory posting. Um, prior to the 2013 Act, a website, website operator hosting user-generated content could be sued in relation to defamatory content, content that was posted on their website. Subsection 2 provides for the defence to apply if the website operator can show that they did not post the statement on the website. However, subsection three provides for the defense to be defeated if the claimant can show that it was not possible for him or her to identify the person who posted, on the, who posted the statement, uh, that they gave the operator a notice of complaint in relation to the statement, and that the operator failed to respond to that notice in accordance with provision contained uh, and regulations to be made uh, by the Secretary of State. Um, just last year, one legal firm reported that it wasn't aware of any reported case in which uh, Section 5 has been run at a hearing. Um, and its experience suggested that the take-up of Section 5 procedure has been very low. Um, and it would want to say that it, it viewed it as um, complicated and onerous and is probably unattractive to website operators who will often have no interest in the matter uh, and who may be able to rely on other defences. Um, in its post-legislative memorandum on the Act, the government stated that in relation to se Section 5, uh, it is understood anecdotally that the provisions have been little used, um, with website operators preferring to remove material or rely on other existing uh, defences. Um, but the government's post-legislative memorandum goes on to state that the defence under Section 5 was introduced uh, because of concerns at that point that operators may not have adequate protection. Um, and if the, if the website operator chooses not to follow the process established under the Act, the defence under Section 5 will not be available to the operator in the event that it is sued for defamation. Um, but this doesn't impact on the availability of any other defences that may apply. Um, the government summed up that the fact that website operators are choosing not to rely on the defence does not therefore appear to constitute a significant issue uh, in practice. Um, moving on, Section 6 created a new defence of qualified privilege for peer-reviewed material in scientific or academic journals. Uh, there are two conditions attached to this. Firstly, the statement must relate to an academic or medical matter. And secondly, before the statement was published in the journal, uh, an independent review of the statement's scientific or academic merit was carried out by the editor of the journal uh, and one or more persons with expertise in the scientific or academic matter concerned. Um, however, if the publication was found to be made with malice, then the defence falls. Mm -hmm. um, research, research from 2019 found that to date no major cases relying on this defence have been reported, um, a fact which may be interpreted either way uh, vis a vis the efficacy of Section 6. Section 8 introduced a single publication rule, uh, which means that provided subsequent publications are made in a similar manner. Uh, an action against the publisher must generally be, br be brought within a year of the first publication by that publisher. Um, so previously, um, each publication of defamatory material, um, each hit on a website, um, created a new cause of action. And so publishers were, publishers were potentially liable, um, however long after the original publication material was accessed. Um, in its report on the draft bill, uh, the Joint Committee um, 
recommended that the single publication rule should protect anyone who republishes the same material in a similar manner after it has been in the public domain for more than one year. Um, but in response, the government said that this would significantly widen the scope of the clause and it did not believe that it would provide adequate protection for claimants. Um, section 9, which we've touched on the issue of libel tourism, provides that the court does not have jurisdiction uh, to hear and determine an action to which the section applies unless it is satisfied that of all the places in which the statement complained of has been published, England and Wales is clearly the most appropriate place uh, in which to bring an action of the statement. Um, and just to give some more context to that, so it sets out in the explanatory memorandum the example that if a statement is published 100,000 times in Australia and only 5,000 times in England, um, that would be a good basis on which to conclude that uh, the most appropriate jurisdiction to bring an action would be in Australia rather than England. Um, now, the explanatory memorandum did recognise that there may be other factors to take into consideration. Uh, so, for example, the amount of damage caused to a claimant's reputation uh, in a particular jurisdiction compared to, to another one the extent to which it was targeted at a readership in a particular jurisdiction, and also the likelihood of a claimant not receiving a fair hearing in a, in a particular jurisdiction. Section 10 replaced the common law defence of innocent publication, uh, removing the jurisdiction of courts in England and Wales to hear defamation cases against secondary publishers, uh, unless it is not reasonably practical to bring a case against the, the author, editor uh, or publisher. Um, and again, we, we touched on this earlier in the context of Northern Ireland. Um, so it protects secondary publishers, for wholesale, retail, newspaper, magazine vendors, distributors, commercial printers, uh, libraries. Um, the previous research did go on to note potential issues with Section 10, for example, in circumstances where it's difficult to locate the author, editor or pub publisher, uh, or where they could not be subject to court proceedings due to bankruptcy or yeah, even death. Uh, it noted that other defences, such as Section 5 of the 2013 Act, could be applicable uh, in those circumstances. Um, Section 11 removed the presumption on favour of trial by juries in recognition cases. Did this by amending the Senior Courts Act of 1981 and the County Courts Act of 1984 to remove uh, libel and slander from the list of proceedings where a right to jury trial exists. Um, essentially, it removed uh, or resulted in defamation cases being tried without a jury unless a court orders otherwise. Uh, in its report on the draft defamation bill, the Joint Committee supported the proposal uh, as the presumption in favour of jury trials works against our core principles of reducing costs by promoting early resolution and to a lesser degree of improving clarity. Uh, it did, however, recommend that the circumstances in which a judge may order a trial by jury should be set out in the bill uh, with judicial discretion to be applied on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. um, and the committee recommended that these circumstances sh should be should generally be limited to cases involving senior figures in public life uh, and ordinarily only where their public credibility is at stake. But in response, the government uh, said that a clear majority of responses to its consultation uh, on this point uh, including from, from members of the senior judiciary, judiciary took the view that guidelines would not be necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the issues that drove libel reform uh, was the occurrence of several high awards by juries, uh, which subsequently had to be reduced uh, on appeal. And just a, a, a brief example of that, uh, Section 11 was engaged in 2014 when Tim uh, Yeo the chair of the Energy and Climate Committee in the House of Commons sued Times Newspapers Limited for articles published in the Sunday Times in June 2013 uh, and thereafter online. Times Newspapers asked that a jury be impaneled to hear the case. Uh, Mr Justice Warby rejected their application, stating that neither party is a public authority. Mr Yeo, while, whilst holding an influential position, is not in government and exercises no state power. Mr. Warby noted that uh, Mr. Miller, QC, uh, he was QC for Times Newspapers, so his submissions do not identify any skills, knowledge, aptitudes, or other attributes likely to be possessed by a jury, which would make it better equipped than a judge to grapple with the issues that arise and may need to be tried. Um, and I'm 
almost done with sure you'll be glad to know uh, section 12 extends the power of the courts to order that a summary of its judgment be published um, this power already existed in a more limited form in section 8 of the defamation act 1996 uh, whereby the court has the party order a summary of its judgment to be published in terms agreed by the parties or determined by the court this was in circumstances where the parties could not agree a correction or an apology uh, so section 12 extends us to defamations defamation proceedings more more generally and just a quick note at the end uh, going back to that post legislative memorandum published in 2019 the UK government uh, found that while there uh, has inevitably been comment on developments in case law from differing perspectives, it wasn't aware of any significant overarching concerns uh, arising from the implementation of, of the Act. Um, so, Chair, that's uh, an overview of the paper. I'll be happy to attempt to answer any questions or look uh, further into any issues for the committee. Thanks very much, Raymond. Any questions? Matthew? Matthew? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's a really helpful presentation. Um, is it? Um, are there any areas in which this proposed bill sharply diverges from the twenty thirteen bill? No, Mr. Edward, so it's, it's largely a reversion to what <coughs> we did not. We we declined to give, or the then minister declined to give legislative consent for in 2013? Yes, I believe that's correct. Yes. When it comes to the, the question about libel tourism, you said that there was no, it was, there basically wasn't, it, the, the evidence that there was uh, significant um, libel tourism to Northern Ireland for, to take advantage of the relatively un, you know, unreformed libel laws was anecdotal, um, but it's I mean, it, it is a it's anecdotal, but very strong anecdotal evidence, as in most people in the sector are um, uh, are fairly confident of that. Is that a fair statement? Confident? Sorry, sorry you just dropped confident that it's it is sorry. a major issue, or isn't the major issue? Sorry. Well, whether it's a major issue or not, that it happens, that there is uh, that it's I suppose. Whether libel tourism is a major issue depends on your view of whether uh, you know it's a it's a good thing that uh, courts here are getting a bit of traffic, I suppose. But it is a fact that um, it, it is anecdotally it's happening. Uh, it's a, a, a I, think you, it's, I think the perception that it's happening is strong. I think the statistically um, the statistics may not well relative to how many, the workload of the judiciary, but uh, I suppose going by the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Act published by the UK government, their view was that, that it wasn't a, a significant issue. Um, and I know it didn't touch in Scotland um, for, for issues of time, but uh, I think the view taken when they were proceeding with their bill was that libel tourism was a significant issue in England, but perhaps it wasn't for them either. But, uh, sorry, just Matthew, just a quick one. Um, could I might ask, Jim has been a QC um, about libel tourism, and I noticed you were indicating there that it, it, there isn't a lot of libel tourism in Northern Ireland. Could you give any information you have to the committee so we'd be aware of it? Well, I think it's, it's at page 53 of the um, pack where the figures are given before the 2013 Act came in. Yeah. We had an average of 35 writs for defamation issued in Northern Ireland. The argument then was that once the 2013 Act made libel more difficult to pursue in England, that there would be libel tourism here. But the figures on page 53 show that in the years since 2013, the number of writs has actually fallen. It's now an average of 30. So I, I would be suggesting that libel tourism is a straw man in this. OK. Sorry, sorry Matthew. Go ahead, sir. Thanks. That doesn't... Uh, that may be true, but it, whether libel tourism is happening, that doesn't... As it libel tourism meaning people uh, writs actively being issued but it, it, it is certainly the case that the provision the differential in our defamation law makes it more likely that someone uh, can for example issue sternly worded correspondence to a potential to a publisher of uh, information that they believe to be defamatory um, with, with the um, 
with the threat or the implication of action based under our sterner laws? Are they not hollow threats if they're not followed through by writs? Well, we don't know. I suppose we don't know. It was my, my, my question to raise is really, um, is, there, uh, is there any evidence that there are, um, uh, that there is legal activity, meaning uh, correspondence, um, uh, you know, uh, out of court proceedings that don't involve, uh, that don't involve the court at all, but you know, greater levels of out of court settlement than in other jurisdictions? Is there, I don't know, is there any evidence for that? I didn't come across any for the purposes of this paper, but again, that, that is an issue that could possibly be looked at in, in more detail. But obviously, the, the birth statistics do reflect the fact that it's it's not a significant issue. But I do take on board your point that um, there could be out of out of court settlements that obviously wouldn't contribute to statistics. Okay, thanks, Jim. Of course, out of court settlements would only arise if a writ had been issued in the first place. Isn't that right? Yes, that's correct. What uh, uh, Mr. O'Toole was trying to get at, I don't know how you would get at that sort of evidence base. Um, well, no doubt Mr. Tweed will appear before us and we can ask him if he's been very busy in the writing of letters. <laughs> Is that a suggestion from the a member from North Antrim that we invite him to come and give evidence? Oh, I would have thought he would be a very suitable witness <laughs> <laughs> in due course. <laughs> Uh, the question I want to ask uh, the uh, witness was, who, who are the main driving forces for this legislative change? Is it fair to say that the main driving force are the media organisations? There was support from the media when you look at the Northern Ireland uh, Law Commission's uh, consultation, um, you know, the Media Lawyers Association uh, and the like. Um, but again, I, I suppose really fundamentally, it, it was born out of the, the work of the Law Commission, um, who felt that, yes, it was necessary to update Northern Ireland defamation laws. And again, that, that was the main driver and then subsequently followed on by the work of, of, of Dr. Scott. But, but publicly, where are the cheerleaders for this legislation outside the media bubble? I'm not. I'm not aware of them, Mr. Alistair, To be honest, I think that's. And the point. second point was: Do you think, or did you discern in your research that there's any chill factor from not from not having reform? I didn't discern any for the purposes of this research. Again, I would caveat that by saying that's not to say it doesn't exist. Um, it was clearly an issue um, for the English and Welsh legislation. To what extent that runs through the Northern Ireland Bill, um, I'm not aware of any. It could be that the Bill sponsor has more information on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Keith? Okay, thanks. And um, thank you, Raymond. On the last page, Raymond, if your document is 39 with 30, sorry, 36 and it's 54 with us, I'm referring to online content and then at the front page of the explanatory financial memorandum, take better account of the impact of the internet. As far as this, why did I narrow is that? We refer to the internet, do we, do we go as far as Facebook, Twitter, or are we just purely internet? As far as this stretch? Based on the on the um, response by the secretary, so it's on the final page of my. I just want to, to, uh, to see page thirty six in you of you fifty four with us. Competence of the assembly to legislate. Well, the competence of the assembly. Yeah, legislate. That very last paragraph. And how wide? How wide is that competence? Are you saying, Mr. No, no. How far does this build? You know, go beyond the online. You know, as far does that stretch? Does that stretch into Facebook, Twitter, etc., or purely yeah. a websites? I'm just trying to. You know, internet is a broad term, and online is a broad term. Uh, I mean, I, I'm 
across is about sort of defining it, but I, I suppose online is online and include include those social media platforms. Um, it's, again, I'm cautious about sort of overstepping my remit, um, not uh, straight into sort of legal advice, but um, I mean, on the face of it, it does seem to be that it have include those social media platforms, including the larger platforms like Facebook and, and Twitter. So obviously the secretary said it was obviously, I don't know, they probably get it from the bill sponsor maybe in more yeah, detail. Yeah. No, so, no, fair enough. That, I just wanted to clarify that. I presume, you know, the definition of online or our website can be dependent you look at it, Raymond. That's all I have okay. for now. Thanks. Yeah. Matthew, short one. Yeah, I just want to make a comment, but also confirm what I may not a, a, a learned gentleman. So I, I, if I was remiss when I say, when we say out of court settlement, that obviously can apply to an issue where a specific writ, where a writ has been issued and the parties uh, before it reaches a judgment in court, decide to settle out of court. But in broad, ge generic terms, it can also mean uh, a situation in which a libel lawyer uh, advises a client to correspond with someone whom they are uh, alleging to have made defamatory statements. And using the corpus of law, which in Northern Ireland, as we know, is stricter than in uh, England, Wales, Scotland, and, now the, and the Republic of Ireland, and say, well, it's in your interests to settle this matter uh, as it were out of court but before we even get to issuing a writ so uh, th I just wanted to confirm that that was when I talked about out of court settlements and we've had some instances of that recently that, that that's what I was uh, referring to I also just want to really briefly the question I wanted to ask was on the, to, the the mirror image of Jim's question about people who are opposed to this bill are there, is anyone opposed to it uh, who isn't a um, uh, in the legal fraternity, <laughs> or it doesn't earn fees from the. No, not, not that I'm really aware of, and I, I would emphasize again and the, the, that there, there seemed to be broad support. Certainly, the people who responded to the law commission's work broad support um, for reform uh, of law uh, in this area. Okay, thanks very much, Malicia. I'm not quite your own. I enjoyed your presentation there as well too. Very difficult to follow at times given the amount of detail uh, within it. Uh, but um, in relation to the serious harm clause and the suggested movie that it may have been part of the reason why uh, there was a fall in the number of liable cases in that in England and, uh, and in Wales. By its inclusion uh, within the bill here in Northern Ireland, uh, do you feel that in some ways that, that might even compromise then, we'll say, for the, the, the citizens' right to, to defend their reputation? Um, I, I mean, I, I don't wish to sort of evade the question, but it's it's probably not a question really for, for me, um, Mr. McHugh, to, to really delve into that. Um, again, that's probably one better put to the, the bill sponsor. I, I wouldn't want to get into the sort of a, a policy issue. Yeah. Keep going, okay. Thanks, Felicia. Thanks very much today. Any other questions? Okay. So, Raymond, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for your uh, comprehensive briefing. And uh, I think it's uh, it's raised as many questions as it's answered. But thank you very much indeed for what you're doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Bye. Okay. Cheers. Uh, from this particular part of the session, are there any actions we want to take forward, or are we better waiting until we've heard from Mike? Wait until we heard from Mike. Good, thank you very much indeed. And can we invite Mike to come in? Uh, Tim, we're now about to receive an oral briefing on the defamation bill from uh, Mike Nesbitt. Come on in, Mike, please. Uh, Tim, the copy of the defamation bill and explanatory and financial memorandum as introduced is page 61. And a copy of the 2016 report on the reform of the defamation law in Northern Ireland by Professor Andrew Scott from London School of Economics is page 97. Uh, Mike, could you make your opening statement, please? Chair, thank you very much. Can I thank you and the committee for your engagement, both members and, and staff? Um, I, I value the opportunity to share my thinking and also to, to field your questions, comments, and possibly even concerns. Um, in, in terms of my thinking, uh, for me, it's simply this is about rights, your rights, my rights, the rights of the people we are here to represent. Uh, and as often the case with rights, we're not talking about a single absolute right. What we're talking about are a number of qualified rights that, to some extent, compete. 
in this case, two rights, uh, one being the freedom of expression uh, and the other being the right to protect your uh, reputation. And they are both qualified. I mean, in terms of freedom of expression, um, I've heard more than one member during my time here say you cannot walk into a crowded theatre and shout far when there is no far. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of the qualification on protecting your reputation, it is only to protect it from untrue, unwarranted, unjustified uh, attack. If your reputation deserves to be trashed, um, it will be trashed. Um, so I guess if, if we think about how we communicate, it hasn't really changed since the beginning of recorded time. We have verbal and nonverbal. We draw, we write, we speak. Uh, but the media or platforms we use to disseminate our communications sometimes change radically. You know, the printing press in the 15th century and the internet uh, in, in the last. And as our laws of defamation predate the invention of the internet, I think there's a prima facie case for saying we need a deep dive review of our laws. And we have had that um, thanks to three executive ministers. Uh, Simon Hamilton, when he was finance minister, spoke to his executive colleague, David Ford, uh, who was justice. Uh, David, in turn, spoke to the erstwhile Northern Ireland Law Commission, mm -hmm. uh, who undertook uh, a very deep consultation, uh, resulting in Dr. Scott's report. Uh, and then that which was published, uh, I think, in June 2016, uh, was signed off for release by Marcino Muller, who had replaced Simon as, as our finance uh, minister. Now, I met the, the Law Commission, Judina Leslie, Chief Exec, and Dr. Scott, before they began their work, and they asked me if I would pause my private member's bill mm -hmm. uh, on the basis that two processes running in parallel were only likely to cause confusion, and we were both uh, attempting the same outcome of, of understanding. Uh, so I did. Um, as I say, it was published in the second half of 2016. And Mike, when did you pause your bill? Oh, just before he began work, which okay. would have been probably late 13 or early 14. Okay, yeah. So uh, if it's not a euphemism, uh, late 2016 was not a good time uh, for these institutions. Uh, as we were, if not hurtling, we were certainly on a direction of travel leading to the, the collapse. So my PMB remained paused through the three-year hiatus. Uh, and while I resurrected it when we came back, we then hit the pandemic uh, and the encouragement from people like Conor Murphy only to focus our work uh, on essential business. And, and while I think defamation is very, very important, I, I can't stretch it into that essential category. Mm -hmm. So it's only in, in recent weeks and months that I've, I've advanced it. And what I've done is I've worked with the Bills team uh, who have made a couple of very minor technical tweaks uh, to, to the bill. And I have also sought the Secretary of State's consent with regard to Clause 5, which governs uh, the operators of websites, which takes us into telecommunications, uh, which is a reserved matter. And the Secretary of State, I'm glad to say, on the 14th of May, said he was content to grant consent uh, to the Assembly uh, to give consideration to the bill. In fact, he said he welcomed the proposed bill. Uh, so that hurdle uh, has been cleared. Uh, and as you know, it's now had its first reading, and it is scheduled, I believe, for the second reading on Tuesday. All right. Uh, at which time, point, I, I, I hope that we will cross that bridge uh, and the, the bill will come to you for, uh, for scrutiny. Uh, in, in terms of, of where I think the Assembly is, um, you know, I've, I've mentioned three ministers. Yeah. One DUP, one Alliance, one Sinn Féin. So that gives you some sense of perhaps there is a cross-party consent to the idea that we need to look at this. Um, I have also, at the invitation of, of Matthew O'Toole, briefed the all-party group on press freedom and media sustainability, uh, and there were no objections uh, raised at that meeting. Uh, and of the 10 signatories to, to that APG, uh, the 10 represent all five parties of the executive, plus the Greens, plus people before profit. Uh, the, the only party not represented, I think, is the, the TUV, uh, but there's no imputation being drawn from me as to, as to why that is. I'm, I'm also informed that uh, Mr. Alistair Khan 
represent himself if, if need be. So I'll, I shall park that comment there. But it seems there is a cross-party uh, support for the idea of reviewing, uh, which is not to say that there is an agreement on the, the direction of travel or, to use that phrase, what success will look like. And indeed, uh, at the end of Dr. Scott's report, there are two appendices. Appendix 1 is his version of a draft report, uh, and Appendix 2 is, is my bill, although pre the tweaking by, by the bill's uh, office. Uh, I would also point out that the majority of respondents to the consultation uh, favoured replicating the 2013 Defamation Act uh, in England and Wales, and there are many advantages, such as consistency mm -hmm. in case law, uh, and, and also not putting unnecessary uh, obstacles in the way of publishers uh, to the extent that they would have to publish separate versions in, in GB uh, and here. And when uh, Lord Black, Guy Black, came, came here to launch my consultation paper, he was executive editor of the Telegraph Group in London. And this was the warning, uh, one of the warnings he gave, if you go separately, you're a very, very small market. And it may be that publishers uh, in GB will simply choose not to publish in Northern Ireland, rather to go to the, the time and expense of, of re-editing uh, their works. A bit like the protocol, mm -hmm. some companies might say, market's too small, uh, I am, I'm not going to bother. Uh, of course, it's not just uh, about the media, uh, but that's where my interest began, Chair. Uh, in my time at UTV, I was involved in three cases. All incidentally involved politicians. Uh, and all were settled out of court with a financial settlement to the claimant. And, and the interesting thing to me about the way it worked was when the writ arrived, we went to the UTV boardroom and you had the production team responsible for the broadcast, senior management, UTV's lawyers, but there were two other people in the room who had flown in from London and they would sit quietly in the corner uh, and listen to the, the arguments, the whys and wherefores. And then on every occasion, they said, settle it out of court. We do not want you taking the risk of going into court, losing the case, and a jury awarding a disproportionate sum of money uh, to the claimant. These two gentlemen were the insurers. So they, they are the ones who, who call the shots. And I, I would draw you to, I think it's item 1.05, in Dr. Scott's report, uh, where he says, the key imbalance in this area is arguably not that in favor of reputation over free speech or vice versa, but rather that between litigants who can afford to defend or to vindicate their reputations and those who cannot. The key imbalance is who can afford uh, to pay for, for these things. So I have 12 policy objectives in the EFM. I won't reverse them, rehearse them all, Chair, but uh, they include making it easier and less expensive to take legal action and make it harder for the rich and influential uh, to chill free speech. Also to protect the right of journalists to conduct responsible and necessary investigations. If, if we think about uh, this jurisdiction as opposed to, say, Dublin or London, scrutiny of government in Dublin and London comes in three ways. Uh, there's an official opposition. There's also a second revising chamber, as this Senate once was, the Shannon in Dublin, House of Lords in London, mm -hmm. and the media. But currently in Northern Ireland, we only have one of those three prongs, mm -hmm. and that is the media. And I wonder how often uh, the media have not published because they have received a threatening legal letter. Uh, and and we, we simply can't compile uh, those statistics. So how big a chill factor does the current regime have. Uh, I, I, I'm also intending to protect the rights of scientists and academics to engage in, in debate. Uh, a school friend of mine, now retired, established a global uh, reputation uh, for his knowledge of epilepsy and pregnancy. Mm -hmm. uh, and at one point, he became convinced that there was a certain drug that a pregnant woman should not take. But that drug was manufactured by a, a global pharma company huge resource and money and capacity to, to take him to court. Now, under, under these proposals, if what he wants to say is peer-reviewed, then it effectively becomes privileged and he can publish. Mm -hmm. That 
protection applies to academics in England and Wales. And again, we don't know how many academics working in medicine and science are not applying for jobs at Queen's or Ulster University because of that chill factor. But we do know there is the imbalance between here uh, and, and, and England uh, and Wales. Mike, sir, when you're talking about, obviously, when academics and peer-reviewed, and it's interesting because there's a definition of what qualifies as peer review. What's your perspective on that? Because obviously one of the things that, particularly in England, it has to be with one of particular journals or a particular idea. But there is what I would call quite a lot of pseudo-academic stuff that is out there at the moment that would not meet the requirement of peer review, but would be seen by some people to be representing academic freedom. How would we get over that point? Or would we look at to take the same sort of journals that are already being mentioned in England and Wales to be able to cover that? Well, I, I think you start with the qualifications of, of the person conducting the peer review and, and what experience and expertise that they're bringing to the table. But clearly, that, that's an area where you could go to court and challenge the validity of the peer review process and those conducting the peer review. And again, I think you, you build up a kind of case law which would suggest where the parameters are in terms of dealing with those things. Okay. Uh, just, just to finish off, uh, Chair, the one other area is, is as I say, the, the internet and the Clause 5, which, which was beyond our competence until the Secretary of State gave us permission, uh, is, is with regard to, to you know, reputations of trash, not on a daily or, or even hourly basis on the internet, it's minute by minute, mm -hmm. somewhere in the world is, is having their reputation trashed. So my, my proposal in Clause 5 is that if you feel you've been defamed, and you're the claimant, a potential claimant, the operator of the site must give you the identity of the author who posted the site. And that, by identity, I mean the contact details so you can pursue them in court. Mm -hmm. And if they cannot or will not do that, you then go for the operator of the site. So you have a clear path to, to rectify and protect your reputation. Uh, in those cases. And beyond that, effectively, what the Bill intends to do is, is basically to, to update, modernise um, the laws of defamation. So, for example, currently we have common law uh, and we have justification of fair comment. I'm suggesting we replace those with statutory defences of truth uh, and honest opinion. And my final thought is, I think, over the period that, that the English law from 2013 has been operating, it hasn't been as seismic in terms of its impact uh, as opponents uh, perhaps thought it would be. So I, I will leave it there, Chair, but what I would ask of the committee is, is that they, they support it coming through the second stage as a matter of principle, uh, and then very happy that, that your committee uh, go through line by line uh, and perhaps recommend amendments for further down the process. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Mike. Thanks, and thanks for presenting to the committee. Um, just a quick one. Um, we've heard a lot about sort of the English process and the rest of it. So why can't we accept a legislative consent measure that comes across to be able to do it to update as to where we get to the 2013 position? Why, why are we looking for a separate legislation here? Well, as, as I understand it, the, the finance minister of 2013 decided not to recommend a legislative consent motion. Yeah. Have we had any indication from, if you had any correspondence or anything from Connor, that he would indicate that he might take a slightly different view than the previous finance minister? No. I, I have had correspondence uh, from the finance minister saying he is not supportive uh, of this bill. Uh, it, it is my impression that um, he has made reference in his letter to the fact that um, the administration in Dublin uh, is looking at their laws of defamation. Uh, with a clear inference that he's perhaps looking for an all-Ireland solution. Oh. Okay. Thanks very much today. Pat? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Michael, for coming and giving the presentation. My, my question is simple. I suppose it, it's answered in a way, and I'm, look, I'm going right back down through a lot of the figures. I'm going to the 98th European Convention on Human Rights which was then written into the 2013 Act in England. I'm not looking at anything specific in that, but the, the, the situation then in England was perceived, perceived to have a chilling effect on the freedom of expression. What you're trying to do is give more openness to the freedom of expression, but also protecting 
the rights of who's stating that or putting that out there. I mean, I'm very interested, that's one point, but I'm also very interested, I mean, there's a lot which would come out of what you're doing. I was thinking of small claim courts within just car accidents uh, coming through there, where it's nearly impossible you could pass the insurers in order to defend your good name. That would give stronger protection to those who state the fact, or if there is a Mm -hmm. prosecution or libel set out against them. Mm -hmm. Am I reading that right? Yes, yes you are. And, and I suppose a change that I should have mentioned was in the definition. Yes. Um, th this idea of you have to prove that you have uh, been subjected to or are likely to be subjected to serious harm mm -hmm. uh, because of, of the statement. So at the moment, as you know, basically the test is would, would a, a reasonable right-thinking person think less of the complainant mm -hmm. because of the statement? Yeah. And, and you know, referring back to the three cases I was involved in, which involved politicians, uh, I have no doubt that if the test had been serious harm, that UTV would have contested and would have won those cases, rather than having to put a sum of money on the table to make it go away. Mm -hmm. okay, and just on the back of that, I'm looking forward to uh, when you get to for second reading, and then it comes forward to ourselves in the mm -hmm. committee. Here. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim? Yeah, a few questions, Mike. Oh, sorry. Jim Wells first. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> ben Trevor, Jim. Um, <laughs> uh, over, over the last month, I've been called a dinosaur, a monster, or a bigot. Perhaps the worst of all was I was accused of wearing a wig. Now, you can call me a bigot or a dinosaur, but anybody <laughs> accusing me of wearing a wig will be definitely be hearing from my solicitor. <laughs> but being a wee bit more serious, certainly we well, wouldn't say Matthew O'Toole's wearing a wig anyhow. You couldn't, you couldn't steady, buy that no, hair. Steady, we're not doing defamation of this I've got privilege. Not privilege. Not privilege. I'm not going to issue a writ. <laughs> <laughs> I've got privilege. I can say anything I like about that red hair. Um, but I've been more serious about it. Um, I, every day in life, I am subjected to online abuse, which I think if I, if I was minded to, I could regularly go to court. But I've only done it twice. Uh, one was a case when my wife was terribly ill with a stroke in hospital. Somebody put online that he hoped my wife had died a long, painful and lingering death, which I took great exception to. Um, it was on a, a social media company based in California that has uh, three billion users. Not any more specific than that. And wh why the, the, the case is still three and a half years later, still marred in the mud, is that that company is refusing to release the identity of the person who posted the comment. Now, we know it is, but they're refusing to um, uh, confirm the name of the person. How would your bill, and I mean, the vast bulk of, of libel will be from now on will be on social media. You know, it's definitely it's going to become the dominant feature uh, on, on these platforms. How on earth could your bill compel one of the largest companies in the world to change a policy of non-disclosure? Well, I, I, I suppose the bottom line, Jim, is that it can't. But what it can do is say, this is your legal statutory duty to disclose the identity uh, of the author of, of the post. But in, enforcement, it's very hard, I think, to, to legislate for enforcement. But then, if none of these companies were prepared to name the person who made the the untrue allegation or the dreadfully and, and offensive allegation. Um, how does your bill succeed? Because this is probably is going to, in the future, cover 90% of the potential claims. Well, all I can say is, is it better to have the current regime, which places no legal obligation on that company, or, or to have this bill put into law, which does place an obligation upon them? But if they're not based within the UK, indeed not within the EU, is there any provision in any form of, of legal sanction that can be used to force them to do this? It was freedom of speech, by the way, was the, the, the defence that this uh, major company used. That, uh, that it, was a, it, was an, it was an order for this gentleman to make this comment because that was his right to have that freedom of speech. Hmm. Um, it, it, is, is there any way around that? Yeah. Not, not that I'm aware of. That's, that's disappointing, but I can understand. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thanks very much indeed. Keith. 
Yeah, thanks. I'm just supposed to follow on, Mike, from Jim's point. Just for, I suppose, a bit of clarity. I'm not going to drill into this too deep. The definition of operators of websites and your response from the Secretary of State, the, e.g. that large company in California and other large companies like it, does that cover them? Mm -hmm. 100%. So the definition of website covers those big companies? Yes. Are they websites? They're, they're op operators of websites. Okay. So the large... Facebooks, Twitter, etc., are websites. As long as that, this covers that, yes. that's your understanding. Yeah, and so okay. I could, could also say, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like a reverse to the point Jim's making, uh, because there's this idea of what they call libel tourism. Mm -hmm. So, if you know some some famous person in America, you know, is defamed, yeah, uh, and they want to do it here in Belfast, if it's been viewed say a thousand times oh. in Northern Ireland. Uh, but two million times in New York State, mm -hmm. and you do it in New York State. Mm -hmm. it, you, yeah. you don't have the locust to, to come here. And then th this final point, th this, I, I can't just see it in front of here, this definition of serious harm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get to Jim's case, but, you know, define serious harm. So if I can get an online ab abuse every night, it's annoying me, it bugs me. Is that serious harm? You know, I'm, I'm not trying to dig it, you know, is that... Is that a court case for serious harm if somebody's given you, as people would refer to sometimes in Northern Ireland, bad manners? But you know, you don't mind political debate online, but there's bad manners. So how do you define that that's not causing you serious harm? Well, for for example, you know, if, if that was happening and it was really getting to you, you yeah. might you might seek medical support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a statement to, to clarify the definition of serious harm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Thank thanks. Matthew? Thank you. Um, I uh, want to go back to one of the points I raised with raised before, uh, pardon, um, around uh, not libel tourism, so uh, but the chilling effect that this has. It's, I mean, it's right to say, would you do, uh, and this is something you have. Uh, explored. I mean, you've been obviously involved in this now for the best part of a decade. That in Northern Ireland there is a, it is uniquely not uniquely possible, but disproportionately and sort of more than in other jurisdictions on these islands. Certainly more than in England and Wales. Certainly possible for uh, someone to use the threat of uh, uh, a, the, the threat of proceedings um, because. To go back to your experience with UTV, the there is a record of um, of, the, of there being first of all a you know an unreformed uh, uh, legal framework, but also high costs being awarded. So um, there is a high prospect of a of a chilling factor. Is that something you've been told about or heard about, and then sort of as you've been proceeding with this um, over the last few years? Yeah. Yes. But the the problem I have is that I can't quantify it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have no idea how many lawyers are issuing these sort of threatening letters, uh, or how often they, they do it. Um, but but I am aware. I mean, there's an old journalistic phrase when you're when you're learning the trade: "If in doubt, leave it out." Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and this kind of takes that to a very serious, uh, very serious place, mm -hmm. because it, it may be responsible and necessary journalism uh, to to say I should be publishing this. Um, but you don't have the defences that, that this bill would offer. You don't currently have those uh, defences. So, it, it's fair to say that, for, it, not that media law in Northern Ireland is a wild west, but it's certainly a more, um, in relative terms, a lawyer who has a record of getting, uh, from their perspective, good outcomes mm -hmm. for their clients, are able to say to um, their clients, uh, I can't, you know, you don't even need to, you may not, we may not even need to order, issue a writ. We can issue a sternly worded letter and then have a conversation with uh, a raised eyebrow and that will be sufficient. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's, that's a fair, fair thing to say. The other, the other issue, I think, which is a chill factor is the fact that it is a jury trial and as I understand it from my experience, all the judge will do is make an initial judgment as whether the statement is capable of being interpreted as defamatory. You will not say it is defamatory out of respect for the jury's role, 
So he will allow the trial to begin on the basis that it can be interpreted as defamatory. And then if, if the jury decide it is, uh, there is no guideline for the quantum uh, that they can award in compensation. So you can understand why, why the insurers are saying, well, we won't cover you because, mm. you know, it, we think this is a 50 grand case. But a jury may say it's a half a million pound. Is there a particular challenge as well around the fact that um, their media here, as in locally, uh, not indigenous, but as it were, media that are, that are primarily based here, you mentioned the Daily Telegraph earlier on, but they, um, it, they are primarily, they're, they're publishing primarily in some cases effectively exclusively for consumption inside Northern Ireland, obviously with the online world that, that, that changes and um, content can be consumed anywhere, but primarily the Belfast Telegraph, the Irish News and Newsletter are still publishing primarily for consumption here inside this jurisdiction, which means that uh, proportionately the, you know, it's obviously much less likely that someone is going to issue proceedings against them in London. Um, so is, is there an added disproportionate burden on them than there would be, for example, in for a, a UK publisher, if you see what I mean? Because they're, you know, the, the, the fact of a uh, relatively unreformed lab, the defamation regime in Northern Ireland is unlikely. I mean, you talked about the potential sort of, um, you know, it, it being a less attractive place for content, you know, people being just not sending their content in some ways to Northern Ireland, but not publishing it for consumption in Northern Ireland because it's, um, there's greater risk. But it's actually, the, the, the real issue is less about the Times of London or the Telegraph or for that matter, the Irish Times publishing content here. It's about the Belfast Telegraph and the Irish News feeling that the disproportionate burden on them is one that is different than it would be for the Manchester Evening News or the... Mm -hmm. let, let, let me put it this way, if, if, I may, if you say you were flying from Belfast to London, yeah. you might buy a Belfast Telegraph at, at the city airport, yeah. uh, which has no mention of uh, a leading respected scientist saying uh, pregnant women should not use this drug. And then when you land at... Uh, he threw, you may find that the Daily Telegraph has a front plate smash mm -hmm. saying pregnant women should not take this drug. That, that in sort of crude terms, is, is the impact. Well, on, the, on, the, on the point about the, 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 so the you, you said the finance minister had sort of implied that there might be, that he wanted to see something, a more kind of all Ireland approach. I mean, I presume that it's, I mean, the government in the South has pledged to look again at different, but I mean, it, it is still a, it's a further step along the road to defamation reform than Northern Ireland is because it legislated about what, 12 years ago or something. I mean, it, it, there's no, I'm right to say that in passing this legislation, there's nothing then stopping uh, a review or something down the line if the Republic changes its law and there are um, any issues. I mean, I'm not aware of any potential issues there could be in terms of uh, all island publications or cross border publications. It seems. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just inter interested yeah. in understanding what his particular concern would be. I don't really. Well, well the, I suppose the way I would see it, in, in an ideal world, this, this bill will go through before the end of this mandate, potentially amended mm -hmm. due to you know, considerations and recommendations from yourselves. But then uh, two things could happen. Uh, there could be a review of the 2013 Act by Westminster, who, who may come forward with some, some amendments, which we would simply migrate across by way of a legislative consent motion. Yeah. Uh, the second thing, and they're not exclusive, uh, is, is that uh, the government in Dublin could come out with a reform of their laws of defamation, and we may look at that and say, well, actually, uh, there's some of that uh, which, which we should be incorporating into ours, so we will amend. But there's no suggestion, I mean, there's no suggestion at the minute that there has been the um, the differential between defamation provision, defamation law provision, North and South has chilled publications, cr the cross-border publication of material as yet. It's not. No, and I'm, 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 I have to say I am not an expert on the Republic's laws of defamation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I just I'm, I'm intrigued to understand what the. Okay, okay. okay. thanks, Matthew. Please. Jim. Yeah, Mike, you talked about when Lord Black launched your consultation, he spoke about the possible chill factories of, uh, factor of companies choosing not to publish here because our Bible laws were different. 
Has that actually happened? I'm, I'm not aware of any evidence of that happen, having happened. Um, Sorry, which is why I said I, I, I don't think the impact of the 2013 law yes. has been as significant as, as yes. some feared. Hmm. What is it about our present system that's broken? Well, I, I gave you three examples of being involved in defamation cases, where in at least two cases, I believe there were good grounds to fight against the complainant. And it, it, wasn't a legal, it wasn't a legal judgment as to whether yes. we, fi we fought it or not. It was a financial judgment. But you're and, still and going to have financial judgment. You're still going to have insurance companies. You're still going to have an insurance company, but they may be persuaded that the test of serious harm is more likely to yield a positive result for their client. Mm -hmm. So, so you see serious harm, the introduction of the threshold of serious harm as something that will help defendants and diminish the chances of plaintiffs? Not, not necessarily. I, I think it will be a more honest and balanced approach rather than the one identified the by, by Dr. Scott. The example you gave of three politicians successfully suing UTV. I said three politicians were involved. Right, OK. Um, Whoever. Uh, in three cases where there are successful outcomes from the painter's point of view against UTV, you would see a purpose of this bill in a repetition of such cases re resulting in a successful outcome for the defendants. In, in two of the cases, because would, would the public right-thinking, ordinary members of the public think less of the politician because of the statement? I, I believe the answer is clearly not. But that was the jury question in, those question in those cases. That would have been the jury question. It would have been. Yeah. And the insurers were not prepared yeah. to let it go. So your answer from the motivation of insurers putting pressure on defendants is to raise the bar for plaintiffs so that they now have to show not just that their reputation has been harmed, but there has been serious harm. I don't think it, it raises the bar. I think it changes the definition, changes, changes well, the test. serious means anything, it surely raises the bar. I, I just believe it, it is a different test. And if you, test? If, you, if you think about uh, what Mr Buchanan said, if, if you were seeing on your smartphone every night abusive message after abusive message, and it was adversely impacting on your mental health and well-being, I think it would be very easy to prove that that was causing serious harm. No, but the, the law at the moment is that if your reputation is harmed, in other words, if the man in the street would think less of you because of what was said about you, then you have passed the threshold for libel or slander. And therefore, you have demonstrated harm to your reputation. By inserting the subjective test of serious harm, you inevitably are weeding out a number of cases and, in consequence, pushing the bar that bit higher for a case to get off the ground. Well, I, I, I will respect your opinion. I'm, I'm not sure I'm entirely in tune with you, but I think probably where I, we might be in agreement is I think it does make it easier to weed out trivial claims. Does that mean, then, that a consequence of your bill would be that you would take away from the county court any jurisdiction in defamation? Uh, no. I, th I think it's the limit £30,000. No, the limit in libel is £3,000. £3,000. Uh, I, I would actually... Justice Minister, there's a consultation out to raise it to ten, but it's, it's still £3,000. Now, if to bring any case you have to go sh so, show serious harm, well, then it's hard to imagine why the county court, with a limit of £3,000, would be even be in the picture. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, yes, it is £3,000. I, I would not object to it being raised to £30,000. I think one of the things to do is, is to make the whole process more user-friendly. 
uh, which is why I have a proposal that unless in ex exceptional circumstances uh, that we do away with jury trials. And, and I know that in this jurisdiction that's a particularly sensitive it is. issue. But, um, as, as you would know, when we come, for example, to the single meaning rule, uh, a judge will not define what the single meaning rule is because he has a jury and he feels it's up to or she feels it's up to the jury uh, to define the single meaning. So Dr. Scott uses the example of um, uh, a businessman, I think, paying tax. And if you were to read that this businessman was very good at avoiding tax, you could take a very negative Im imputation that, that he's a bit of a scoundrel in, in the, involved in illegal tax evasion. But equally, you might say, well, actually, what that means is he's very, very good at managing his tax bill, and what he does is he, uh, he donates to charity uh, and, and gets tax relief on that, and this is very pleasing to the shareholders. But if, if you do away with the jury, there's no bar then on the judge defining the single meeting right up front, which could really speed up. Well, I think you're doing much more than that. You're <laughs> handing to the judge the determination of whether the harm is serious or not. Yes. So a judge, and some people think that judges get a bit aloof from real life, will decide whether or not someone who feels sufficiently exercised to have brought the case and to have taken the financial risk in bringing it, because there's no legal aid in defamation, uh, that a person is going to be told by a judge, you didn't suffer serious harm. End of case. So you're taking away from the citizen the right to put before his peers or a court the question that his reputation has been diminished by sifting it through a judge's view of what is serious harm and what isn't. That may not be very confidence building with the individual who's been overwhelmed by what he thinks is quite a dastardly thing to have said about him. Well, that judgment has to be made, whether it's by the judge or, or by the jury. Hmm. Uh, and it is my clear impression that under the current regime where it's done by a jury, uh, it is a much longer and more expensive process. And as you say, legal aid isn't available. Yes, but uh, I'm not sure actually the, the cost issue I don't think this proceeding will make it any cheaper uh, to either defend or, or to bring proceedings. But the great chill factor in anyone bringing libel proceedings is the potential costs. That isn't going to be changed by this. Costs are still going to be astronomical if you lose. Costs will, will, will still be high. I think, I think what it might change would be uh, in a successful case, because as I've said, as I understand it, the, the jury are not even particularly advised on the quantum. Well, they're given a general sort of ballpark yeah. arrangement. So if the judges are the ones deciding on the quantum, you might see more consistency uh, in the but awards. Just, just on that point, if the system is broken, can you point us to any cases in recent years where there's been an outrageous decision in Northern Ireland out of our current system? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of one, but I haven't mm. been studying uh, See, the application. I was, I was trying to think of that myself, and I can't think of any that you would say, wow, that's way off beam. Yeah. I, now, I, if that's the case, then it brings you back to my first, or one of my first questions. Is the system broken? Well, to, to answer that, I would feel that I, needed, I would need to know about the out-of-court settlements. Mm. How often, why, and the quantums. Yes, but your bill isn't going to either pry or change that, is it? I, I, I believe that it will, in that you're changing the test. Which brings us back to the point that the test is now tilted more in favour of the defendant, of the media company, because that will give them the courage to fight. In other words, they wouldn't have fought 
which does raise with me the fundamental question from the perception of the citizen. Well, why are we in the business of drafting legislation that makes life easier for the media companies? But it also makes life, I would contend, easier for politicians. Why is that? Well, I've given you an example of, of the three cases, with, all of which involve politicians. In two cases, the politician was the claimant, and in both cases, uh, the insurers were responsible for them being offered a financial settlement. But those insurers, I'm going to make the point again, those insurers will still be saying to you, it's cheaper to settle than to fight if you lose. Well, I, I think it changes the, the test because what, what those insurers were saying was that if the judge says this is capable of being interpreted as a defamation, he will initiate the trial and he will hand over control to a jury over which we corporately have no control. And if they find in favour... Who's the we? Well, the, 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 the lawyers, the broadcasters, the, the jury are autonomous. Yeah. And, and if they find for the claimant, uh, there's very little control over the quantum that they could award. So it goes back to point 105 of Andrew Scott's report. So w w what I'm saying is if, if it is a judge <coughs> without a jury, right up front, he doesn't say this is capable of being interpreted or not. He says it is or it isn't defamatory. Well, it, is, it does or does not give rise to serious harm. That's what he says, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It, it's only defamatory yeah. if it has or is likely to cause yeah, serious harm. Serious harm is a filter to yes. filter out cases, which brings me back to the point that this legislation is about diminishing the opportunity of the citizen to bring a claim because he has to get past a judge who says, OK, you suffered harm, but it wasn't serious harm. Go away home and pull yourself together, man. Yeah, well, you're, you're defining it as diminishing. I'm defining it as, as offering something fairer. Fairer for whom? Sorry? Fairer for whom? For, for everybody. Not for the man who's told the harm you suffered wasn't serious. Well, what if the harm he or she suffered was not serious? But is that not the point of libel, damage, of libel damages? That they then relate to the degree of the harm. If the harm isn't serious, then they might get one P or ten pounds or hundred pounds. Because damages reflect the seriousness of the harm. So if the harm isn't serious, they're not going to get a big award, are they? That may be the case. If the system's working, that should be the case. Well, I, I contend the system uh, is capable of improvement. But there's no examples in the last number of years of where the system got it badly wrong. In terms of the quantum? In terms of the quantum or even a finding of libel. Well, I, I have not studied every mm -hmm. uh, defamation case, and as I've said, one of the reasons for that is it's what's happening behind the scenes. The out-of-court settlements, uh, which, we, which we cannot trap in terms of a statistical analysis, uh, but which I suspect but you is can, very significant. Which you can never control. Yeah. People I, I, have all sorts of reasons for settling cases. They don't want to be named. They don't want to have the bother, etc., uh, etc. Et they want to keep their legal bill down. You know. This legislation isn't necessarily going to change that. Well, I think it will, for example, if you are a scientist or you are a, a researcher in medicine yeah. and you really want to make a statement uh, which is critical to, for example, a multinational pharma company, yeah. that this gives you protections you do not currently have in terms of... And that gives you privilege. Yeah, yeah, it gives you peer-reviewed privilege. Yeah. I think I'm more, well, actually, I have a reasonably open mind on this bill, but I, I certainly have a lot more sympathy for the point you're making mm. about the privilege than, than about the serious harm. I think that's my big stumbling block with this bill. Um, but thank you. Oh, yes. Well, well, can, can I say, I mean, like, you're the lawyer. Is, to what degree do you think it is possible to codify serious harm? 
I don't think it really is possible. I think each, each case rests on its own facts. I don't think you can really have an open and free legal process whereby the citizen is entitled to come to court and have his rights judged if you put into it a bar where a judge decides whether or not it's serious harm or not. I think that's a, a problem in terms of open access. Okay. I, I assume, Mike, you'll, you'll amend Clause 9, which still keeps us in the EU. <laughs> Leave that in. <laughs> Through the chair. No, we won't. Right. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Jim. Philip. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mike, for your presentation. Uh, I don't intend to uh, interrogate you quite uh, as vociferously uh, as as Jim just did, but in terms of you know Jim's line of questioning, it, it kind of reinforces my opinion that I was surprised that the second reading is next week. Uh, given that you know we we haven't as a committee had an opportunity to uh, talk to department officials or even the minister uh, in terms of their position on the bill, I mean I know you, you've received correspondence from the minister and you've you've given your your own interpretation of, of that correspondence to us today. You know, so it would have been useful. Just I mean given the kind of questioning and the, indeed some of the speculation that we, we're going over here today, because a lot of this is actually speculation. I mean, you're pointing to three examples that none of us sitting here can be confident one way or the other that any different legislation would have changed either the outcome or the decision to take the court. It's all purely speculation on your part. And I'm not sure that us uh, formulating and designing legislation based on speculation is the, is the right way to go about it. I mean, w w lots of people have asked questions about the libel tourism. We, we got the opportunity to ask the same questions earlier during the Ray's presentation. So, I mean, w w in terms of libel tourism that, that has been talked about, I mean, the simple reality is that it hasn't increased since two, 2013 and anything over above that is just speculation. Uh, I mean, in terms of the point you did make about the the minister and the review of legislation in the south. Well, I mean, it's I mean that's not just uh, in terms of all Ireland uh, approach, which personally I think would be sensible. I don't know if that's what the, the minister meant uh, in his response, uh, but I still think it would be sensible. I mean, it's not something that Andrew Scott uh, would disagree with because I mean he did say that the North needed specific legislation to reform libel law. So, I mean, I think that in itself would be sensible that we look at jurisdictions on this island and uh, beyond to see what kind of specific legislation we've made. I mean, you, you talked about publications from GB uh, that, that also uh, publish here, but I mean, the same argument is on the south, north, Basis. So, you know, I, I think that we do, you know, and I would agree with Andrew Scott in terms of a sp specific legislation, and I think that that's something we do look at. But in terms of my, my, my points, I mean, just in terms of the label tourism, because I, I don't, don't think it was that question was specifically asked you. I mean, uh, can you confirm that, that it hasn't increased uh, since 2013? And then the other issue uh, that, that you touched on and Jim previously touched on was the jury trial. I mean, Obviously, removing jury trials here in the North could be seen as a backward step and a threat to the principles of the right to a fair uh, trial and access to justice. So, I mean, would you accept that jury trials play an important role in public confidence in our legal system? Yeah, um, on the latter point first, yes, yes, I do. And I think I acknowledge that, that jury trials have a particular resonance and significance uh, in, this, in this jurisdiction. Um, for, for reasons we, we don't need to uh, to rehearse. In, in terms of the timing, I mean, could, could I say that, uh, you know, I got my first reading, I think it was in early June. Uh, there was then a decision to be made as to whether I press for the second reading before summer recess. Uh, not least, and then the advantage of that was, you know, not, not, once we get back next week, we're gonna expect in the final months a lot of legislation to come out of the executive. So there's a danger of of losing the bill. Um, 
even if it does get through its, its second stage next week, and I make no assumption on that. So the decision I, I made was because I have been living this for a while, but you haven't, as, as a collective of, of MLAs, that I would wait until after recess and that what I would do after the first reading was to compose a one-pager which I put in everybody's pigeonholes and which I believe my office also emailed to all the MLA accounts just to give that kind of uh, top-line indication not only of that the, the bill was coming uh, but that what the policy objectives and, and the intent, intent was. So maybe it's not ideal, but I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, hallelujah, I'm, I'm discussing defamation with a committee for the first time mm -hmm. since, since 2014. And, yeah, and, and, and I, all, I'm, sorry, all I'm asking is that, that we have a debate on Tuesday uh, and that you allow it to come back to committee. And, and what happens after then? Who knows? And I'm not a die in the ditch, take it or leave it. I'm, I'm more than happy that we look at everything. And you know, that this idea that maybe serious harm is, is not the best definition to put in the bill. Uh, let, let's talk it, let's talk it through. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, you, 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 you've obviously on assembly committees and have been the chair of, of assembly committees. I mean, in terms of us doing our role, uh, uh, even for the debate on Tuesday, but just doing our role in the committee, it would have been, or it will, would be better if we had all the arguments and allowed all the participants to come before us and give evidence. Yes, but in June, as I say, I, I put a one pager in your pigeonhole, offering to meet any MLA, any group any party to, to discuss and one one party did take up the offer and had about yeah. half a dozen people in the room and we talked it through for a couple of hours yeah but I, I'm, I'm specifically talking about the department having had their opportunity to come before the committee uh, I mean and give their view on the legislation in the second stage. I, I can't answer for the department um, I, I, I know I was asked if I would come and, and speak to this committee ahead of the second reading, and I'm very happy to do so. Okay. Okay, okay Philip. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, Mike. Any other comments from the committee? Okay, Mike. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, members, and thank you very much indeed for listening through the evidence and the evidence we had that came through from Ray's as well. Uh, first of all, are there any specific actions we would like to take for, wish to take forward? Uh, I understand, Philip. Do you want to come in again? Obviously, we haven't heard from the we have we haven't heard from the minister, uh, and, but, and as chairman, I wasn't aware of the fact that the second uh, reading was going to take place next week, and I don't think Peter was either. I don't think we knew that yet, chairperson. I don't no think I don't think the business off the business committee's yeah. actually sat, so I'm not quite sure where that information came from. So uh, that I understand I understand where your comments coming from, Philip, but. Uh, yeah, I'm as blindsided as you are in this with the timing as well. And obviously it would be useful if we got the Minister's view and perspective of the Department on this bill because obviously uh, Mike is talking about his correspondence with it, but we haven't heard from the Department either yet. So it might be useful if we wrote to the Department to get the, his view. Sorry, go ahead, Jim. Chair, I must say I disagree. Uh, Tuesday, if it is Tuesday, is a vote on the principles of the bill. The bill yeah. And surely that's for each and every MLA and their parties to reach a view on. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us should be coming to this coloured by what a particular department thinks. No, sorry, I probably got that the wrong way around. What I was trying to do is there's part of this information we haven't received yet, which was what was the department's view on it. I don't think that if it comes before us on the... That's, that's a different question if it comes before us yeah. in the second stage. That's but quite right. Custom and practice, as I understand these committees, is that... The bill sponsor is given an opportunity, it's not a necessity, to come before a committee before a second reading as a general educational process. Mm -hmm. But that I've never known of a case where other evidence is heard before the second stage. Before the second stage. Okay. I'm just trying to remember. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't. You're just referring to your bill. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. No, we didn't hear second stage. Okay. Any other comments? 
Okay, team. Um, obviously, there's, if, depending on when the second stage goes ahead, does anybody wish to give an indication how they might vote in respect to the second stage of the defam defamation bill? Or are we going to? Okay. Therefore, therefore, are members content for me to contribute to the second stage debate, indicating that the committee is probably supportive of its passage to the committee stage of the bill? Whoa. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Philip. I mean, that, that's the point that I that, that, that's the point that I was trying to make. I mean, maybe I'm wrong in terms of procedure and who, who comes, but I mean, certainly. I mean, I would. I mean, in any debate or argument, I like to hear all the arguments before I give my opinion. Uh, and in this case, you know, w what I heard from Mike, as I said, uh, w no, a lot of it was conjecture. I mean, I, I didn't think he particularly convinced me when Jim Allister was questioning him. Uh, so fair play to Jim in terms of that. So I mean, a lot of it was just supposition, conjecture. I mean, I, I don't think any of us uh, have any problem. I, mean, I certainly don't have any problem with the theoretical view that uh, we could have updated libel uh, legislation. But the key point is whether this is the way to do it. And that's why I would have liked to have had departmental officials to come forward to say, you know, why? I mean, because the only thing that we got out today was that the minister has written to uh, Mike to say that he couldn't support this bill. I would like to know what, what the reasoning behind that was to help inform me, make up my mind. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't personally speak and that's, you know, allow the committee to have an opinion because I don't think we have, I mean, I, I you know, I'm going to have to look, think personally myself, if it is between now and Monday, you know, what my opinion is. Yeah, well, sir, if I can say that actually at the second yeah. stage, actually, you don't even have to speak at all if it comes in front of the, the second yeah. stage. Look, I think the only thing that be said on behalf of the committee is that the committee heard from the bill sponsor. And I think that's about as far as we can go. Yeah. I think just, sir, I'm not saying anything contrary to that. Okay, okay. content. So I'll I'll speak at the I'll I'll speak at the uh, bill whenever it comes the second stage, whenever it comes forward, and just say that we heard from the bill sponsor. And so there is a varying set of views expressed at, at the meeting, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think we probably, it would also be probably useful, and again, we sh I think we should write to the minister anyhow, just to get his views on the bill, because I think that would be useful so that we would have that as a committee. Um, and I think that would be useful. Go ahead, Matthew. Presumably we're not going to have that for Tuesday. If no, this not before Tuesday. Like I mean, look, we're speculating that it is Tuesday. That's that's you know, the problem I have. I have no information that it is going to be Tuesday or not. So, uh, but I think we should be writing to the minister anyhow, because it is a bill that's coming before us. At, we've had this, and it'd be worthy of us getting the view of the minister and the department on it. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next item was that the committee. Um, I think when Paul Paul Free was in the committee, the committee had suggested a change to standing orders, which would allow a bill sponsor to join a statutory committee as an ex officio member in order to allow the speedy resolution of queries during the committee stage. The committee has asked to know if the committee on procedures has yet to advise on any relevant change to standing orders and is very unlikely to, to do so during the anticipated committee stage of the bill. Are we content to note? Mr Chairman, uh, yeah, that, ahead, that came about as a result of the very helpful input from Jim and yeah. uh, in his bill, uh, which frankly would be floundering without his input. But what is there anything to stop us as a committee inviting whoever we like to sit in on committee meetings and ask them questions? Uh, Chairperson, to, to advise, in terms of the bill sponsor, what the committee could do is in, they can invite any other MLA along, but they are not allowed to question witnesses. And of course, they're not allowed to vote. Yep. Um, but what members might be able to do, and I'm seeking advice on this, is that, uh, Mike, if, if there was a committee stage, and that uh, gets through second stage, the bill sponsor could sit in if members agreed and um, make comments to the chairperson. And the chairperson could then say, well, witness, what do you think to that? So it's, it is a bit of a swizz, a bit of a cheat, but I'm, gonna, I'm seeking advice on whether that is acceptable. If we can, we can take this separately, so we can, um, myself, myself and the uh, deputy chair will we'll, we'll discuss that. Um, take that forward. But, yeah, take it. But, but surely, chair, there's no restriction on the number of times this committee hears evidence yeah. from the sponsor. Yeah. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah. And uh, it would probably be a good idea to um, encourage the uh, bill sponsor to come along. Um, yeah. 
what we would typically do with the department is you might have two or three evidence sessions with witnesses, have the department come in last and then answer all of the questions that were uh, raised during his previous evidence sessions if the bill sponsor and his helpers were able to do so. So you can yeah. certainly do it that way, which is uh, clean and clearer. What happens to, sorry, for my own education, what happens to other bill sponsors who are not members of a particular committee bringing it forward? But Jim, you were well, on our committee. I've been so that through this it. before. My first bill, I wasn't on the committee. I gave a presentation like this before the second stage. I then gave formal evidence, and the I was stage. brought at the, uh, in the committee stage, and I was allowed to come back to respond at the end of the committee stage, as I recall. Could you listen in? Were you in present when the evidence was being taken? Only if I listened in. It was my option. It was a public. Yes, yeah, public. Unlike yeah. now, yeah. you could come in and sit. So yeah. I, I did. Okay. Quite often. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda is correspondence. Uh, correspondence index. The members are asked to note index of eight received items. Thank goodness. Uh, on correspondence from page two hundred. Uh, the first one is EU Regulation twenty twenty one four one four. Members are asked to note at page two hundred four a copy of the correspondence between the House of Lords Subcommittee on the Northern Ireland Protocol and Treasury seeking clarity on the impact on Northern Ireland businesses' engagement with the Executive in respect of EU Regulation 2021-414. The regulation pertains to electronic systems for the exchange and storage of import-export information. Treasury seems to indicate that the Trader Support Service will advise Northern Ireland businesses, and that changes may follow UK government discussions with the EU on the protocol. Consideration was this deferred from last week. The correspondence now includes the explanatory memorandum and the missing appendices. The correspondence appears to indicate that no executive department commented on the correspondence. Jim, would you like to say well, something? I think I made that point last week. Yeah. I have tabled a number of questions to relevant departments asking them why. Matthew, yeah. Okay, Matthew. Well, I just think it, um, it makes the, the, the case actually something we might have to grave, hopefully, uh, agreement on at some stage that the, the necessity for uh, better consensus on how we regularise information sharing and scrutiny uh, of, um, of, these, um, of these matters. Um, just for, just um, uh, for a, a note of information, uh, conversations I've had over the last couple of days outside the committee, but uh, might pertain to this. There was a considerable amount of uh, discussion about one of the difficulties that is now being received about gathering of information and the difficulty of actually uh, understanding and getting the necessary information that there is. And one of the th main issues by a couple of members of the sort of the business community was that there is a considerable amount of detail of information that's available through sort of trading systems, logistic systems and the rest of it. But the problem is that it doesn't speak to um, the HMRC system or the other data systems and the two IT systems are incompatible. Uh, the words used to me that one is in the 21st century and the other is probably still in the Stone Age when it comes to talking to each other. I think there might be a real data adequacy issue that might be involved in this as well. So it might be something we might con take consideration when we're taking more evidence on the protocol. And I think we're doing that next week. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm just to say, are members content to write to the Executive Office um, copying the Department for Finance and other statutory committees and ask why departments didn't provide any commentary on the regulations? Is the committee content to also ask the TEO to set out the scrutiny process for any future EU regulations and to suggest that relevant statutory committees be kept advised, as would usually be the case for Westminster statutory instruments which touch upon devolved matters? Are we agree? Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Moving on to the report of the Department of Finance Equality Scheme, members are asked to also note on page 217 a copy of the Department's report on the Equality Commission on the Department of Finance Equality Scheme and Section 75 duties in 2021. The report details actions the Department has taken, amongst other things, to increase employment in the NICS of young people and minority groups. In AQWs, the Department advises that the number of 16 to 24 year olds has increased in percentage terms quite significantly very recently, and other measures are planned. Matthew, would you like to say something about that? Uh, just that I mean, it's, it's welcome that the, we're, that the number of under 24s obviously is a, a bit of a crisis we're facing uh, in, in, in the civil service. It's something that we should, I think, 
uh, keep under consideration. We've talked about getting um, evidence from the uh, head of civil service, HR, and the new head of the civil service. I think we should be asking them about this and what specific plans they have in place to address the, um, the, the age profile question. Okay. Is the committee content to note uh, pending the briefing on the 3rd of November by... Sorry, Jim. Sure. I, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, not many others might agree, but I notice at page 227 of the pack that the department has again renewed its Stonewall membership and has submitted itself essentially to Stonewall, marking its homework in terms of diversity uh, in the Stonewall Diversity Championing Programme. I'm also conscious that across the water, the Equalities Minister has advised government departments to quit the Diversity Champions Programme, that the GB Human Rights Commission has quit the programme, all because of the campaigning controversial stances off Stonewall, particularly in relation to transgender issues. And yet here we are tying ourselves to an organisation which has gone out of its way to, um, I think, uh, create controversy on some equality issues because of the rigid agenda that they stick to. And mm. I, I don't find it pleasing that the department is blindly re-engaged. You know, the Stonewall recently in a report uh, said that uh, freedom of speech is all very fine, but it has its limits. <laughs> and challenged uh, the people for daring to hold a view that uh, you cannot change your biological gender um, and describe that as akin to anti-Semitism. And for reasons like that, that across the water there's been a distancing from the overtly campaigning Stonewall and acknowledging them as the diversity champion. Yes, I would be very supportive of Jim's views. Um, Stonewall is a very radical, extreme organisation, um, which um, is entirely biased in one direction, entirely opposed to those who hold a different view, a traditional view on family and gender. And I'm alarmed at the amount of public money that's been poured into it in Northern Ireland from many organisations. Uh, and therefore, um, I notice, for instance, the police, PSNI, are giving them considerable funding, which seems way beyond anything that they, they warrant. I think in times of very difficult constraints financially, this is a waste of money. An ego trip by one or two senior executives in the, in the department. And I don't think it should continue. I don't think it's needed. And I totally support Jim's comments. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Matthew. Well, I think... Uh I think I'm, I, it would be remiss of me not to uh, respond in very strong terms to what's been said by the two previous speakers, um, particularly that because the historic context is, of course, that Northern Ireland has consistently failed its LGBT plus community in terms of delivering uh, on basic levels of uh, equality enjoyed by other citizens in not just the UK, but the Republic of Ireland. So I would strongly disagree uh, with the foregoing um, uh, comments. Uh, I welcome that some uh, measure of uh, uh, attention is being given inside the Northern Ireland Civil Service to uh, ensuring that we, um, uh, that we are uh, not just meeting our obligations, but um, uh, you know, properly promoting and championing diversity and equality in the civil service, uh, and long may it continue, and long may it improve, should I say, because we still, uh, still have progress to make. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, yeah, to, to the chair. Uh, exactly what Matthew has said there. I think that particularly in Northern Ireland, because of many of the prejudices uh, that I'd expect my full support again too for the LGBT community and that as well too. And every effort that's made then within organisations as well too to ensure that that equality, that equality which is the right of all citizens is respected. Okay, thank you, Malicia. I think there's a variety of views there and the rest of it, but uh, duly noted. Uh, move on to the next item on the agenda, a review of the Department of Finance Equality Scheme. Members asked to consider at page 280 correspondence from the Department seeking the Committee's views as part of its review of its Equality Scheme. A copy of the current Equality Scheme is appended. 
Are members content to write and inform the Department that I expect the Department to forward its findings from stakeholders when received? And at that stage, the, con the Committee will consider the equality scheme. It's better to see what they say first before we get involved. Are we great? Great. Uh, Special Advisor Annual Report. Members are asked to note departmental correspondence at page 328, including the Special Advisor Annual Report. Under the Civil Service Special Advisors Act, Northern Ireland 2013, the Minister is obliged to lay a report indicating the number of spans and their salary. This has been delayed owing to changes in the DUP team. Anybody wish to comment? Chair, I just want, I think it's good to have, well, I would say this, I think it's good to have the report, but uh, one thing that puzzled me about it, when you look at page 330. Hold on one second, Jim. Sorry, I've got the wrong page. Give me a second. At page um, 332, uh, though the average salary of a SPAD has dropped by £10,000 since five years ago, the annual salary bill has increased by 10 per cent, roughly. I didn't quite understand. Is that increased pension contributions, maybe? Or I don't know. It, was it due to the fact that some of them had to be laid off? Does it include? Does it include? Well, that wouldn't be a salary bill. That would be a. Mm -hmm. I would presume that would be those costs would be separate. Right to the department. And see. Well, we do know in the column above that the raw salary figures eight seven six. The national insurance is one hundred and three, and the pension contributions are two hundred and eighty five. I was just puzzled how, if the salary scales, if the salary average salary is down, ten thousand, how this this the bill for salaries is increasing. Mm -hmm. what, what period of time did that kick in the salary? Well, obviously, when they came back in the f on the whatever date it was in January. Twenty twenty one. Mhm. Well, it's yes. Yeah, what salary bill is twenty twenty one? Yeah. Mm. I think it worthy if we ask the question for a bit of clarity on it. Yeah, I could do any harm. Agreed. I think we're agreed. A bit of uh, question yeah. clarity. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Next item: the gender reform of property management programme. Members are asked to consider at page three 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 a response from the Northern Ireland Audit Office indicating that the introduction of hard charging is a key property management control and one which, if introduced across the office estate, would foster commercial style discipline. The Controller and Auditor General describes the Department's explanation for its apparent U-turn on this matter as not very convincing. Thank you, Kieran. Excellent. Understand. Is the Committee content to write to the Minister and seek his views on his Department's decision to backtrack on previous commitments made to the Audit Office? I think we would be agreed to that. We are agreed. Excellent. Uh, moving on to Investment Activity Report. Members are asked to know at page 341 the latest invest Investing Activity Report. The Department has a limited capital programme which is largely restricted to refurbishment and support of the reform of property management programme. Are we content to note? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, next item is civil service pension retirement provisions. Members are asked to note page 344, a departmental response regarding the extent of partial re retirement on the, in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. There is a markedly higher percentage of Northern Ireland Civil Service staff that are partially retired compared to the Home Civil Service even though the level of eligibility in Northern Ireland is lower. Jim, would you? Well, I, I raised this before uh, at a previous meeting. Um, I'm happy enough to let it sit at the minute. Okay. I'm not uh, going to raise any uh, the hairs on it. I am in a slightly difficult position being the chair of the pension trustees here that I don't say anything too controversial. Okay. Are we content to note anybody? Yep. Sorry, Matthew. Well, I, I am content to note, but I also think we should be sort of putting a bookmark on this for our conversation with Nick CHR sure. yep. later yes. in the autumn, because uh, as we discussed before, so well, uh, two thousand partial retirees is, as we know, getting on for ten percent yep. of the entire civil service workforce. Fifteen hundred is, I suppose, you know, uh, seven or eight percent. Um, therefore, uh, I don't think, unless I've missed it, I don't know if did you, you said the whole civil service. You didn't. You don't. But we don't know what the what the a, a comparable number would be 
in the UK civil service, or for that matter, in um, you know another big public sector employer. So uh, I think it's a question we should be going back and asking to next HR when we talk to them. Yeah, I just think the committee it seems to be. If we look over the year, uh, years, it seems to be growing. It seems to have become a nearly a management tool in some respects. Mm from senior management of going on sort of partial retirement and then sort of uh, staying for a few days and whatever the, the procedure happens to be. It, it's now become sort of nearly like custom and practice. More a sinecure tool, I think. Maybe that's harsh, but... Could they introduce it for I would, I would, I would <laughs> disagree with that, sir, Mr. Hollis. Well, I couldn't I mean, possibly them, say that. Most of them are not, and obviously most people, but it would look to be... Most of them aren't at SCS or even middle management level. They're very much at the um, the sort of lower to middle slash um, administrative grades. So that it, it wouldn't suggest that there's a huge amount of people who are being sinecured off in cushy jobs. But there is a so it's, 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 I'm less concerned about that. But it, I do still think it's an interesting question to ask about workforce management and and whether this fits, fits into a broader picture around the age profile and and all yeah. that. And also, there's a question I think we do put to next HR when they come, because the question of somebody is in a role for three days a week or is in partial retirement, does that block that as a uh, an opportunity for promotion, or does it move it? Is it you know does it in some way or another sort of reduce the sort of the flow of uh, sort of um, staffing as required? But we can tend to know and raise this issue. Sorry, go ahead. Am I misunderstanding something on page three four four? It says partially retired numbers, 2018. And then when you go to page 348, it tells you 1,529 of those are in what we would regard as the regular lower grades. Does that mean that 500 of them are in senior grades? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a fair interpretation of that? I think it's a question we'll ask when we get the next HR in front of us. Because it says ten senior civil servants. I don't know. Mm, but then, I thought, are they... but then you look at sort of grade six, grade seven. Yeah, and senior grade it says ten. So where's mm -hmm. how do they reconcile fifteen hundred to two thousand? Where's mm -hmm. the reconciliation? I think, Chairperson, if the member looks at page three four seven, uh, it's fifteen twenty nine is the total number of people currently working in reshaped jobs. This is out of a total two thousand and twenty nine partial retirees. Uh, from a number of employers administered by the civil service pensions. So one refers to the civil service and the other refers to other organisations which uh, come under the civil service umbrella, I guess, or the civil service pensions umbrella. For the arms length bodies. So My understanding would be the 2029 refers to people who are potential, who could potentially do reshape jobs. They, they have the status of being partially retired and that 1529 is the number of people who are actually working in no? No, the 229 are the actually partially retired because that's what it says. It's the 1529, I think, are the civil civil servants. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm taking it to mean? Yeah, you know, but, what, but what I mean is that one, I mean, we won't be talking cross purposes, but the 152, the 1529 is included in the 202. Yes, yes, right. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, it's the, and those are the people who are actually going in and doing a reshape job, whereas the remaining 500 are presumably not doing reshape jobs, they're just on the books as partially retired? No, they're in farm strength bodies maybe or something. Yeah. Like oh right, yeah. okay. I, th I okay. think the members yeah. right. that's why I would read that. Fine, okay, that might be, yeah. Could, could we maybe ask for a breakdown of that 500 yeah. in terms of arm strength bodies? Agreed, yeah. yeah. Content? Yep. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, move on to uh, item nine on ministerial correspondence. Uh, we just need to be cautious when we talk of this. Uh, members are asked to also note on page 356, restricted ministerial correspondence, providing an update on the RHI disciplinary process. It appears that one individual in the senior civil service, i.e. grade 5 or above, was subject to sanction. The other seven cases considered by the Northern Ireland Civil Service and the two cases that we have been briefed about considered by the Cabinet Office did not lead to any other sanctions for various reasons. Uh, are we content to note this pending the closed session briefing on the 29th of September? Um, just point. Um, I'm surprised actually we got that correspondence as as we did, but uh, okay. noted. Okay. 
I'm moving yeah. on. The... Sorry. Militia, did you say something? Yeah, we're content to note it. Okay, thanks. Moving on to the composite request, members are asked to consider the composite request on page 358. Uh, members content the composite request is an accurate complete record of the committee's information request. Are we agreed? Yeah. Okay. Moving on to the forward work programme. Draft forward work, work programme is page 365. Uh, legislative consent motion. Uh, departments led a legislative consent motion relating to the Public Services Pension and Judicial Offices Bill. The clerk has re circulated related papers by email. Briefings from the Department, Assembly Research and Public Sector Unions are scheduled for the 22nd of September. Are we content to publish the relevant papers on the committee's web page? Agreed. Financial reporting bill. Uh, the committee stage of the financial reporting bill began before the summer. The committee launched a call for evidence. A small number of responses have been received. Very few have been substantive. The committee staff are to follow up with key stakeholders. A SharePoint folder will be established so that members can view all of the responses. In the meantime, as is usual, is the committee content to share the responses with the department and publish them on the committee web page? Are we agreed? Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Are members content with the forward work programme as amended? Great. Agreed. Can I just say, Go ahead. We had just on, on next week's hearing. This is the first we've seen of who's actually that I've seen, unless it's been of who's going to be attending next week. Uh, or was this? Or was this on a long? Was this drawn from the long list of? Sorry, I don't. The, the next question. week's hearings. Yes. And um, just because we didn't have that, the, we didn't have the. I don't think we had the named witnesses. We have we've got the RHA and the UFU. You want the names of the witnesses? No, not the names of the witnesses. I just wasn't. We, I don't think the names of the organisations was in. I think we had uh, NI was protocol it? expert. It might have been in last week. I, um, I don't think it was. The, the, I mean, it's just a, a kind of a, a couple of questions. We're going to have them at the same time, and one other thought was the RHA are obviously do lots of interesting organisations, but it's it might be worth us also having Freight NI who are have a a, a kind of. View of the whole logistics, um, including freight forwarders, and um, so that would be my suggestion. I'm happy uh, to. Um, I think uh, uh, chairperson. I think they were on the, someone from freight uh, logistics and I, freight and I, as they're called, were in the. Um, uh, were on our initial list, and we. Hold on. Let me. Uh, sorry, logistics. tell you exactly who's coming from RHA from the uh, Routology Association. It's this opens. Among yourselves, mind the gap. Here we go. It's uh, no, that's wrong. Um, sorry. Uh, Aren't you the organisations are, goodness sake, is Gray and Adams and uh, Target Transport, as well as uh, I can't remember the name of the chap from RHA. They're coming along. So um, they're members of our. They're they're, they're yes. companies. They're, they're okay. Yeah. They're haulage companies who are members of RHA rather than just the RHA corporately. That's yeah. right. The RHA corporately are coming along as well. Okay. Um, so they are uh, the Northern Ireland uh, sort of branch there of John Martin, I think, is their policy manager. So they'll be along. So I would suggest members that it's going to be two briefings. First from RHA, we give them 50 minutes, sorry, 15 minutes, minutes to make their point. And then members can ask questions for a further 45 or so. Then UFU. Um, 15 minutes again, 10 to 15 minutes, and then another 45 minutes for. Who's coming from the UFU? It's not Victor Chestnut. We were trying to get him, but apparently he's in London. Um, so it's. Uh, let me tell you. Uh, it is not here. Um, maybe it is. Sorry, members. This will all become very clear on Friday when it's in the meeting pack out. <laughs> um, but for now. I No, sorry, don't have it. I'll have to send you. Okay. Because okay. I don't have that. Don't have that in front of me right now. Um, but okay. it isn't. We were trying to get Victor, um, but I think he has uh, another engagement. Um, I think it might be their policy um, lead will be uh, come along to speak to us. Yeah, it's uh, James there's a big, James there's, a big, there's a big Northern Ireland event next week in London. I think right. it might be on the Wednesday. The business community and um, selling Northern Ireland, so he might be at that. So it's their policy lead. I think is Mr. McCluggage. Yeah. Used to be in Dera, if I recall correctly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, and another. So uh, that's the uh, plan for next week. Okay, if we're happy and content with the forward work programme? Yep. Excellent. Uh, any other business? Good. Uh, date and time of the next meeting. The next meeting will be take place here Wednesday, the 15th of September at 1400. Uh, thank you very much indeed. The meeting is hereby adjourned.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.